<laughs> Tom, how are you, mate? Yo, good, thank you. You? Yes, yes. So you got that's quite a nifty little shoot you got there, is it not? <laughs> yeah. What's the color? Is it? Is that any special colors? I, I've just briefly glimpsed it. Then was it red, white, and blue or something? Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. And you had a cutaway yesterday. Uh, yeah, I did. I was doing some canopy formations with a team I jumped with. And uh, yeah, my canopy got torn on the front. I had to cut away. Yeah, not ideal, but part of the job, I suppose. Bloody hell. How many cutaways have you had in your skydiving career or your jumping uh, career? Um, probably about six or seven now, something like that. That's a lot. Yeah, it's How... not too bad. None of, none of that's due to packing either. That's... Uh, that's mainly canopy formation stuff because you end up crashing into each other and all that, you know, good stuff. Yeah, so you're like on your old nine lives then, mate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm using them up pretty rapid. <laughs> and um, do you worry when you cut away that maybe the reserve, that's that's buggered too? Uh, generally, you don't really have time to think about that. But uh, I did once on my first reserve ride, actually, cut away, pulled the reserve and I had a pilot shoot in tow and I literally had to reach over my shoulder and yank the bridle to get it out. So that, that wasn't ideal. But um, yeah, I think I'm past thinking about that now. It's just automatic reactions when you've been doing it for a while. And sorry, how many jumps did you say you've done? Uh, I'm on about four and a half thousand now. Bloody hell, that's a lot, isn't it? It's it's not in comparison to a lot of people out there, but I'm not a full-time skydiver, so yeah, it's not too bad. I've heard full-time guys with about... 12,000, is that about right? You can get a lot more than that too, yeah. My brother's on about 10 or so. He was a full-time tandem instructor for about 10 years. Mm. So, um, yeah, you rack them up if you're doing it all the time as a job sort of thing. I only ever tried to do group work once, and I partnered up with this lad. He was a Swedish lad. Yeah. And we jumped out the Cessna, like you do. <laughs> Off we went, and he just went, Woo! <laughs> and I went, Woo! and I and I watched him go down and I didn't even have anywhere near the skill or, or even to Delta track. I could, there's no way I could have like caught up with him. And Yeah. Yeah. It takes a little while to build up to that sometimes, especially if you're not compatible on your full rates and weights and stuff. Yeah. But my bloody instructor, when we would, when we were doing the AFF course, I'll be there doing all the drills that he asked me to do. And I'd look down and, He's there lying underneath me like that, <laughs> watching me from <laughs> from Just about ten, out. 10 foot un underneath. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a mental world, isn't it? It's a, it's, it's an insane, insanely fun sport. Yeah, it's expensive as well, but it is good fun. Yeah, expensive, and also in this country, it's the the weather can be an issue. Yeah, you're better off doing it overseas, but then again, that's more expense, isn't it? But yeah, mm. it is um, an issue in this country because even in the summer, you can be blown out by the winds and stuff. Yeah, I did mine in Florida. It's yeah, it was funny actually. I I took my pilot license in um, a place called Fort Pierce, All right. and then they gave me an aeroplane to fly up to a place called Sebastian that you may have heard of. Yeah, yeah, I've been there. Yeah, yeah, to do my skydiving yeah. course, and I remember flying up there thinking. They've trusted me with a whole aeroplane. <laughs> I wouldn't even trust myself with a skateboard. <laughs> yeah, I learned to skydive in the States as well, North Carolina. Oh, there you go. So you can get loads. Of, you, you, you literally get down, pack your chute, get straight back up again. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm. yeah I love it. And so you've had an illustrious career, mate, haven't you? I've... Um, I had was had your email up on the screen a minute ago with uh, the notes you sent me. Bum bum bum. Oh, in fact, I may as well just put it here. Um, so, twenty five years in the parachute regiment. Yep. Uh, in one para, the Pathfinders and the Red Devils. Yep. And then another eight years um, in the reserves seven operational tours so i'm guessing you're a glutton for punishment <laughs> yeah i suppose so yeah 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 apparently 25 years wasn't long enough so i had to keep cracking on i've literally just left the reserves in february actually yeah so what are you looking for like the reserve reserves now 
<laughs> so I'm doing some work with cadets now, but uh, also doing other bits and pieces, projects and stuff. Yeah, we'll come on to we'll come on to all that. And um, I mean, to serve in the illustrious Red Red Devils, that's a that's one for the bloody tale of the grandkids. Yeah, had a fantastic time there. So I was in the Red Devils back in 2000 for three years. Had an absolutely fantastic time. Um, but I decided to get back in the green kit because Iraq was coming up. So I thought, you know, get back in the green kit and actually do the job for real again. Yeah, that's where a jolly can go seriously wrong, can't it? If, if you're yeah. stuck on a, stuck on sports and all your mates go off to war. Um, exactly, yeah. Just talking about that, I did a podcast this morning with a oppo of mine jeff williams hello jeff if you ever get to see this and uh he was 4-2 commander in the falklands and they didn't want to let him go because he was on a senior command course oh man <laughs> and i think like a lot of people we went no i'm not <laughs> yeah you don't let me go with an i'm leaving and and gosh yeah, especially the falklands falklands was a one-off wasn't it you know, it wasn't like Iraq and Afghanistan where it was rolling deployments. It was a one-off. And the guys that missed that must have been pretty sore, I reckon. Must have been traumatising in itself to miss it. Yeah. You know, just the whole, I mean, we, we, we God, it's quite an emotional podcast because I was actually, I was 12 years old, but for some reason we were driving back from a holiday somewhere and we were going through Portsmouth or, or, or coming back, back down south at least. Yeah. And all the cars were packed with servicemen with their families had, you know, come to collect them. And, and we were just yeah. waving out the windows and they were saluting. It was just a, a monumental time in, in, yeah. in Br Br British history. Um, a historical big moment in time, that, yeah. Mm, gosh. And it, it inspired people like me and you, didn't it? Yeah, well, massively. The... The chap I joined up with, my neighbour, his dad was the um, sergeant major of Lima Company. So he was well, you know, like well, well in the thick of it. It was, um, yeah. yeah, full on. It was kind of they picked the wrong theatre of war there for us, didn't they? Because it's what we train, what we train in. Yeah, and, it's like identical to Brecon, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> I remember yeah. one. Um, I remember watching one documentary, it might have been a lecture we had in the Marines, and the chap said that uh, they were on a fighting patrol one night and they came across an Argentinian patrol and they spotted each other and the Marines went to ground in a, in a stream, so up to their necks in in water in a Falklands winter. Yeah, and um, And the... The patrol leader for the Argentines said, "You know, come out, British soldiers. You will not be harmed." And he just said, "We ain't getting. We, you know, we're this is this is we're in our element, mate. We ain't going nowhere." And then he tapped his um, GPMG gunner, and they just they, you know, killed them all. Yeah, um, mega. Yeah, just <laughs> just unreal, unreal stories. Yeah, but, all, my, all my instructors in depot were Falklands veterans, so yeah, they had some uh, good dits, as you'd say, in Marines. So, so yeah. what, what was your, what was all your P Company and your jumps course like, Tom? Uh, so I joined the army at sixteen. I joined up at Junior Para when it used to be just Junior Para, as opposed to Harrogate that it is now, and that was tough. That was hard, really harsh, really controlled. Um, I actually had to go through P Company twice. I got injured on the first one. Went over on an ankle, wrecked my ankle. Uh, so I got back squatted, had to do it again. Um, but to be honest, um, you know, I, I didn't have any problems. I was fit as you like at the time. Flew through it, other than getting the injury. Um, and then flew through it the second time, no problem. Jumps course. Um, yeah, I, again, I got injured. I broke my leg on the jumps course on my seventh jump. And this is when you had to do eight jumps to pass the course. So, yeah, not ideal. Broke my leg six months later, got tabbing again, and then passed out of training. So I had a couple of hiccups, a couple of um, injuries, but absolutely, you know, wouldn't wouldn't change anything. Absolutely. I wanted to be a paratrooper since I was about seven years old. And I joined up the minute I could when I was 16. And I left the minute I was told I couldn't stay in any longer because I've been in the whole time. Mate, you broke the golden rule of jumps training is land on a Gurkha. 
<laughs> we had Gurkhas on our course and they were, um, yeah. I'm not joking. Oh, my God. We come so close. Yeah. I love it. You nearly take them out and then they stand up and say, I'm sorry, sub. <laughs> <laughs> you, ain't just, you haven't done nothing wrong. <laughs> yes. Oh, I had them steering towards me and all sorts. So I went straight into the rigging lines of one of them because he was steering at me as, as my canopy was opening. <laughs> Remember that? Yeah. Did you, um, did you still have the balloon when you did it or was it the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I did my uh, wings course in 90, sorry, 89. Um, and they didn't get rid of the balloon until 94. So, and I did a handful of balloon jumps after my course as well when I was in battalion. Mate, how old are you now, if we're allowed to ask? 50. God, you don't look it. Yeah, cheers. <laughs> that power stuff must have been a bloody lot easier than the Marines. That's all I can say. Uh, <laughs> that's enough about that, mate. <laughs> oh, dear. Yes. Yeah, but the old balloon, that, that was a test and a half that because you haven't got the, the, the noise, the movement of the aircraft, and you basically just, it's all down to you. It's perfectly still. It's quiet. You stand on the edge of the, the cradle and they just say go there's no pushing and it's all down to you it's cold quiet and calculated and you just drop for about 300 feet or a couple of hundred feet at least your stomach rises up and you're shitting yourself but it was mega <laughs> i think it'd make a great like um stag weekend thing you know yeah you and your mates go and do the balloon jump yeah. after 12 pints <laughs> I've since went over to Belgium and done their balloon um, a few years ago when I was in four para. I actually went over to uh, Belgium and um, did the balloon over there. And it's the same balloons we used to use. So that, that was a bit of a blast from the past. That pretty cool thing to do. Got the Belgian wings out of it as well. Wow. Yes. <laughs> yes. I remember our, um, they drum it into you, don't they? 1,000, 2,000, 3,000. Yeah. You're not allowed to deviate from that. Yeah. And, uh, the PJI come running over to us on the, when we were on the deck and he said, Throw, where's fucking throw? I said, I'm here, Corporal. We went, what do you fucking mean, Geronimo? <laughs> 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 I'll tell you what, though. Uh, it was because I could feel the shoot coming out and I knew I was all right. Do you know what yeah, I mean? I could yeah, yeah. feel how safe it was and I could feel that it grabbed the air. And I was yeah. just like, oh, I'm all right now. So yeah. <laughs> just having confidence shouts. in the kit and saying sod it, eh? Just getting out, mm. going for it. So, gosh, mate, so much to talk about. I don't know what to talk about first. What? Oh, oh I'll tell you what we can do. We can say hello to Steve Brown, can't we? Hey, yeah, Steve, how you doing, Mucker? Yeah, hello, Steve. Steve, you're um, being your fellow Pathfinder who who very yeah. kindly came on the podcast and uh, we talked a lot about scrapping. <laughs> And, yeah. and writing books, I think. I think Steve, didn't we? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Steve's a top bloke. Yeah, mm -hmm. served in the same times as Steve. He, he joined a couple of years after me. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, top bloke Steve is. How you? How have you dealt with the the old, um, you know, fight anybody mentality now that you're you're civilianized? Uh, yeah, I'm pretty. I'm pretty all right with it until somebody kind of gets me rubs you up the wrong way. But yeah, I'm, I'm pretty good with it to be honest. I've managed to adjust pretty well as well. So far, so good anyway. Yeah, Steve and I were saying it 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 borders on criminal the aggression that you have when you're a young <laughs> you're a young soldier. Oh yeah, yeah, when you're younger for sure, yeah. I mean the yeah, mum now people that must have got a smack in the mouth and probably didn't even say anything wrong. <laughs> yeah. Probably probably misheard them in the pub or something. Yeah. Yeah, Definitely. shouldn't shouldn't laugh, but again, it's all part of the role, isn't it? It's all part of the conditioning. It is, yeah, yeah. It's the mindset, isn't it, to breed that sort of aggressive young soldier, yeah. So what's it like then as a, a young para when you rock up at your your first um your first unit? Um it's quite intimidating, obviously, because you know, you're the newbie, you're the noob again, after being the 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 sort of like getting a towards the old sweater depot, you're then suddenly the newbie. And um, yeah, I mean, I was only just 18 when I passed out of training. Uh, you've got all these guys that are, you know, in your eyes, mega old sweats. They're probably 24, 25, um, ripping you all the time, get a bruise on and all this. But I think I was a little bit, what they call a chopsy crow at the time. I wasn't kind of going to back down on anything. And I, I, I kind of think got a bit of a reputation for being a bit chopsy at the time. 
Um, within six months of being in one para, I was in front of the CO on on CO's orders. Um, believe it or not, for the destruction of Airborne Forces Day. <laughs> oh dear. Yeah. How did that so, come um, about? Airborne Forces Day is a massive, massive piss up in all the shop. Thousands of people, well, it used to be thousands and thousands of people, beer tents, Red Devils jump in, you know, military displays and all that sort of stuff. People come from all around the world. When I first joined up, there's loads of World War II veterans coming in, people from Germany, America, and it's just one big, massive party. Well, there's a friend of mine whose dad had served for 22 years. He said to me in the evening, come on, Tom, let's do this. This is what you do on Everyone Forces Day. And we climbed up the side of these tents, ran along the top beam, and on the way back, I mean, these, these are massive, big beer tents, you know, and on the way back, I fell through because we've been drinking all day and just about managed to grab hold of one of the guy ropes as I fell through and it ripped the whole tent open. And I've got literally hundreds and hundreds of people looking up at me going, oh, no, he's going to die. But I climbed down the rope and it all split, fell on a table, and then everyone else copied what me and my mate had done. And the whole place just got decimated, <laughs> absolutely and utterly destroyed and decimated. There was people falling. There was a band playing. People fell on the band, smashed up people with broken limbs and all sorts of stuff. It was mental. Um, the other guy didn't come back off leave. We went on leave shortly after. And um, he actually banged his head by climbing on top of his roof doing something. So he obviously had a thing for heights. And I basically took the brunt of it. And I got put in front of the CO. Uh, and luckily for me, I got what's called a regimental entry. So I didn't get fined. And I didn't even know what that meant at the time. Uh, and when I got out, I said, well, what, what does that even mean? He goes, oh, you're, not, you're on a promotion ban. I was like, well, let me just join the tally. He gives it down. So that was, um, that was a bit of a scary moment being in front of the CO. 18 years old, six month in battalion. <laughs> yeah, so like your career's almost over before it began. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just going to pop my headphones on. We've got some, um, in fact, we've got some, um, apparently our, our live stream is buffering. Friends, how how is it doing now? Can you let me know in the chat? Apologies. Um, uh Perhaps, uh, Greg, you could give us a running commentary on how how we're doing. Um, it's it's not an issue, Tom, because I'm recording this anyway, so we can all, we can always um, we can always upload it again. So, um, yes, ha and what what was your first deployment? Right. So we uh, at the end of my first year. Um, we were actually getting ready to go to the Gulf, 1991 Gulf War. Uh, we'd done loads of NBC training, as it was called then, loads of AFV recognition. We got issued extra weapons. So we had two GPMGs per section and we had two M79 grenade launchers issued. And we thought, I thought my Christmas had come early. We, I thought we were going to war. And then all of a sudden we revert back to plan A, which was meant to be doing, because someone decided they weren't going to send Power Edge anymore. And uh, we went to Northern Ireland. Uh, January 1991, as the Gulf War was kicking off, and I was gutted. Not that I was going to Northern Ireland, but because I wasn't going to a conventional proper war sort of thing. Mm. And yeah, we did two and a half years in Belfast, basically. Um, I literally just turned 19, two and a half years over there, back when it was quite a dangerous time, when it was trying to, you know, blow you up and shoot you most days, and people hated you, you know, spitting at you in the streets and all that good stuff. Quite a quick way uh, for growing up, I think. Yeah, uh, our tour was eight, 89, but I, I wouldn't, wouldn't have wanted to do two and a half years of it. Yeah, so that was a res residential tour of um, Palace Barracks, just outside Belfast. Mm -hmm. um, but when they say residential tour, it's meant to say and sound like it's nice. It wasn't. It was We was either deployed on the streets, we was training, or we was on stag. It was pretty much that. Um, we were very, very busy. If we weren't in Belfast, we were deployed in other regions and stuff. So, yeah, very sort of busy tour, stagging on off looking, you know, patrolling, basically. Yes. Uh, friends at home, if you pull your bar back a bit, your progress bar, it will buffer better, appar apparently. Thank you, Greg. Um, and did you do any more deployments, Tom, active service before you volunteered for the Pathfinders? Uh, yeah, we went back to Northern Ireland the following year for another six months. So within five years of being in one power, I'd spent 
um, three years in Northern Ireland. So we did another six months of backing in Belfast as well. Um, and that was it. So my, my next one was with Pathfinders after that. Where were you on the second tour of Ireland? Uh, back in Belfast. Oh, that back was, there again. Yeah, so back in Belfast. So I, know, I know Belfast quite well, especially the, the sort of uh, western areas of it. Yes, the Ardoin and yeah. the like. Leonard Doon and all that, all that good stuff. So uh, from my chat with Steve, um, we ascertained that the Pathfinders is bloody hard to get into. It's, a, I mean, it's a, it, I don't know if you class it as a special force, but it's on that. Yeah, know. it's it's not classified as special forces, but you work along with, with special forces quite a lot, and on special forces lines as well. Mm-hmm. Had you had you managed to get many jumps in before you you went for your selection? Uh, well, funnily enough, I, I did my AFF course the year before I went to Pathfinders because I was just I, I was gagging to learn the skydive anyway. I was I, I've done a, I've done a basic course at Cyprus where you do the static line, you know, three second delay, five second delays, and all that sort of stuff, and I, I loved that. Um, and I didn't really get the opportunity to go back again because of Northern Ireland until 94 and then myself and a bunch of the guys basically we didn't do an army expert we went and paid to do it off our own backs mm. in uh, North Carolina loved it I'd probably done about 55 skydives before I went to Pathfinders within a year um, and I don't know probably 30 20 30 static line round canopy jumps as well but I could have saved myself a whole lot of money by just waiting until I went on PF selection but I, I wasn't waiting I, wasn't, I couldn't wait to, to do it to be honest I think you probably did the right thing. When we went to Norway, uh, me and my mates, we took ourselves off down a dry ski slope and we um, we learned to ski. It's a completely different yeah. type of skiing, as you know. But, it, 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 I mean, at, at least we could do <laughs> one kind of skiing. So when I got out there, it wasn't all so alien. In fact, I came, I think I came eighth in our first company ski race. So all these old sweats and pe- yeah. people that have done like nine winters and I, I um, track, which basically means get out of my fucking way. I'm coming through. And uh, yeah, I, I came eight, eight for that one. So I was quite pleased where it did benefit us is at the weekends, we went down to the actual proper ski slope. Um, I think we, we went to um, Lily hammer and I'll tell you what it, if you've learnt downhill skiing on a dry slope and then you go on the real stuff, you're like Franz frigging clamour, man, you know? Yeah, yeah. It, it, you're almost like doing 360s on your first day. It's, yeah, it's, it is easier, isn't it, on proper yeah. slope? Yeah, incredible. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah. But anyway, skiing's for sissies anyway. Um, real, men, <laughs> real men snowboard, everybody knows that. <laughs> but we all make mistakes. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. So, um, when you did your AF, AFF, how nervous were you on your first jump? Um, I don't think I was too bad, to be honest. I was kind of mad for it. I was quite young anyway. I was only 22 and I'd already done that Cyprus basic course, done my military jumps and I was gagging to do it. So yeah, nervous, but not like terrified nervous. Like I see some of them you know, at these heads. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was pretty, I was really up for it. Mm. I was first out on mine. Everyone behind me were doing tandems. Yeah. And, um, actually did the very first jump in New Zealand. And I just remember thinking, fuck me, as you get up there, it's, it's a very different thing to jump in at, what is it we jump out in the military? It's quite low, isn't it? It's uh, 800 feet static line round. Um, and for train troops, they go down 600 now. Yeah, which is Freaking a big bad. difference from like 10,000. Of course it is, yeah. Massive. Yeah. I remember looking around at these all these tandems, you know, doing their birthday jump or whatever, and they're just shitting themselves. And I thought, <laughs> I am not going to let them see my fear. <laughs> yeah. So I was a tandem instructor as well for quite a while. Um, and yeah, it's, it's amazing to see people's raw sort of emotions, raw reactions, because you can't cover that stuff up. It just, it's just automatic reactions. And it, yeah, it was a great thing. Though. Did you have any mishaps with, you know, did people really screw it up for you? Uh, yeah, it's a few. There was, I had a couple of people pass out on me. Um, 
and I managed to wake just about wake them up before we landed. I had a couple of people puke on me. Uh, nothing worse than that bodily function wise, but I had a couple of people puke on me. Um, and a couple of people just could, you know, going crazy as you leave the plane, kicking around the legs, which obviously send you unstable, which means you've got a flipping weight till you see the ground before you pitch the drogue. But um, yeah, the only actual proper malfunction I've had where it was something to do with a parachute that wasn't packed properly was on a tandem as well, actually. So it wasn't my pack job. Someone else had packed me a dodgy pack. Mm. Uh, I had a line over on the canopy, which means it's a rotating, you know, it rotates, pump the brakes. No, nah, still there. I just said to the passenger, right, you ready to go again? And they're like, what? I'm like, head back, legs back. <laughs> and they cut away, pull the reserve. But um, yeah, that's the only actual malfunction I've had. I've had six or seven actual reserve rides, but that's due to doing canopy formations where things go wrong once mm. the canopies are actually open. Did they, did, they have to, did they have to pay twice? <laughs> <laughs> no, but somebody had to pay for a reserve pack job. Obviously, it wasn't them, though. <laughs> Gosh, and tell us a bit about the pathfinders then. What, what's the you know? Well, to, to tell us an, anything, Tom. I'm sure everyone will be yeah. fascinated. So I, I once I've been in battalion a few years. Um, I wanted to kind of look to the next level and do, do something a bit more challenging. Um, and also, I was getting sick of going to Northern Ireland, as I mentioned earlier. So I looked at pathfinders. I knew a couple of people that had gone there that I really sort of looked up to that were really really good soldiers that I knew from battalion. Give it a go. And yeah, the selection, as Steve Brown mentioned, was incredibly, incredibly hard. Um, it's only six weeks, but it's tough as nails. Um, it's straight in as well. It's not like, I say, a selection where it kind of builds up. It's day one, it's like a brick wall smash, and it stays at that level for the whole, the whole time. Mm -hmm. And because it's so compact, you don't have time to really recover from anything the whole way through it. So it's, it is a very, very tough course. And the instructors, uh, you know, they're, they're perfectionists. They're watching it every move again because it's a smaller course in selection as well then they, they can concentrate more on individuals and they know you pretty much from day one as opposed to selection where they've got hundreds of guys i'm not saying it's easier i'm saying it's different mm -hmm. um and then once you get there though it's that it really is a, a, a fantastic place to be because everyone's super motivated they want to be there professional soldiers and the job is just fantastic you know working in small teams um big boys rules and all that i, I just loved it and how long's the course, Tom? So the course was six weeks. I think they've extended it now to seven. Um, and then you do see it after that as well. So you, you don't do it as part of the selection course, but when the SEER course is available, they, they load everyone on the next next available course. And you um, if you fail it, you obviously you get RTU'd anyway. And I did that three times, SEER as well, just for a treat. And SEER, what's that? Survival, escape? Survival, evasion, resistance and extraction. Okay. Where do you do Wait, that? Uh, so it's RAF St. Morgan down in Cornwall. Um, hey, I'll tell you what, is there a fucking place you want to escape from, man? It's fucking Cornwall. <laughs> Mate, it's just, it's over, it's literally five minutes over there. I should know. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, and how many, how many blokes started and how many blokes finished? Uh, on my course, I think it was something in the region of 30, 30 something, 35 or something. And we actually had a very, very high pass rate. We had 10 guys pass the course, which is very un unusual. I mean, normally for that amount starting, you probably get five or so pass. Um, but we, we had a very strong course. We had a lot of guys that were incredibly fit, very strong soldiers. And to be honest, a lot of them went on to SF as well later on. Mm. And the jump spit, was that included in that six weeks? That's no, no, no. So later on, basically, again, when the course becomes available, once you've passed, um, you go on to a, your halo course, what used to be known as military freefall. It's now known as HAPSI, High Altitude Parachute Course. And it's a week at Bryce Norton, followed by, I think it was four, three or four weeks in, uh, in the States over in California. So that was, that was amazing, obviously, getting to go to California, go skydiving. Jumping at night, halo, oxygen, 25,000 feet. Fantastic. It, you're carrying a lot more kit though, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, so, the, I mean the, par the parachute alone weighs up to around about 50 pounds. Then you've got a weapon, then you've got oxygen kit, then you've got a Bergen, and your Bergen's going to be weighing 100 pounds plus. So anything up to 120 pounds or so, you know. So you're carrying your own body weight at least. And 
I guess you carry a lot more. I mean, the history of the Pathfinders, by definition, they lead the way, don't they? That that so yeah. you've got all your advanced technological yeah. equipment. I'm guessing. Yeah. So you know, a lot of it's to do with comms, isn't it? The old saying, no, yeah, no comms, no bombs. And your your job is to find out the information, reconnaissance, send that information back hundreds of miles sometimes. So you've got HF radios, VHF radios, UHF radios to talk to aircraft, all the batteries to go with all that kit. Then you're carrying a minimum of seven days rations, plus all your water, plus your OP kit, and then your actual personal kit, plus weapons, ammunition. So yeah, it's a hell of a lot of weight, an awful lot of weight, mm -hmm. a lot more than I carried in one power. And there's hey ho and hey low. Yep. Do you do both of both of those techniques? Yeah, so hey low is your free fall, high altitude, low opening, and hey ho is high altitude, high opening, where you exit the plane, it's on a static line, so the canopy opens straight away. So you're opening up at 25,000 feet, and you're basically gliding for miles and miles and miles at night, navigating using GPS um, compass, and um, sometimes above the clouds. So that, that was a pretty amazing experience as well. A bit bloody frightening as well, though, eh? Yeah, it's pretty cool, though. Yeah, it's a pretty cool experience. If you're into parachuting, you know, um, you, you can't pay to do that. You, you can only, if you pass a selection course, basically SF or PF, that's the only place in the UK you get to do that kind of parachuting. Mm -hmm. And it's it's fantastic. It really is. I mean, you're jumping out from such a height in the dark, can't see anything below. If you don't get it right... I, even if the battery and your GPS go, you, you, you could be coming into water, trees, yeah. mountains. Yeah. You, you could lose all your body buddies, especially on, uh, in a, in a real, real life scenario. Yeah. You could, we, we, yeah, we, we did a one that springs to mind. We did one in the States once we was on a training trip over there. Once we'd qualified, we used to go over there once a couple of times a year and that I was doing a night jump from 25 grand. Hey, ho. And, uh, the REF had got the calculations wrong. So basically what they do is they calculate the wind um, and the speed of the canopy, the distance and stuff. And the idea is to, you know, to get to your target, they drop you off a certain distance. So, and that can be 30 miles or, or more, you know. Anyway, they got it wrong on this particular one and it's a night jump and we're coming in and we've seen a couple of lights in, in the distance and we thought, all right, that must be it then. Because they, they, they put normally just a couple of little minimal lights to mark the DZ. And as we're getting closer, it turns out it's, it's a wagon trail thing you know like the circle of wagons vehicles and these americans are sat there having a barbecue out in the ulu in the desert on their own and uh, we landed just outside of their their circle of vehicles and they hadn't even seen or heard us and um I basically we, we had our weapons with us and stuff so we were carrying them you know non-threateningly we walked over to them and they didn't even see us coming because they're, they're sat there in the you know having a barbecue with the flames so they're, they're blind they're blinded by the light and we literally walked up within a couple of feet of them and had to say hello before they, we started it. You know, and uh, they were like, shit, man, you guys are on our side, right? We thought they thought they'd been invaded by the flipping Russians or something. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's flipping hilarious. <sighs> but you've got to be careful because they're all carrying weapons over there, aren't they? So you don't want them to turn around and flip and slot you. <laughs> well, yeah, you, yeah, there's always that. That's why yeah. it's always surprised me some of these... Um, like videos you see on YouTube where they that someone's fucking with a complete stranger and you're like, it's oh, yeah, not yeah. it's not the right country to do that. It. No, everyone's talked up, aren't they? Over yeah. there, you've got to be careful. Yeah, and they're all egomaniacs as well. And people who yeah, are some egomaniacs them, yeah. don't like being made to be to feel small. So oh. um Tom, I've just flashed up there your your uh, online moniker logo prepared pathfinder. Yeah, yeah. Um, just that thing there on my head. Yeah, folks at home, Tom's got a, a blossom in. Hey, do you see the parachute reference there? Blossom in. <laughs> okay. Blossom in YouTube channel and um, also on Instagram. As I was just going to flash it up again, prepared Pathfinder. Um, just have a look at some of your photo series. Is that you? All um. You're all kitted up for a halo, and you're pointing. Yeah, that is you. You told me that, oh, that's, didn't you? Yeah, that's the exit shot. Yeah, that's the that's the most walked picture ever. So because you can't see the face because of the oxygen mask and stuff, 
you get a lot of water meters saying, oh, yeah, this is me just doing a halo jump. But genuinely, <laughs> it's me. Yeah. Yeah, that's how we got in contact because yeah. my producer used that picture for one of our clips for Steve. Steve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we didn't want to put Steve's face on a video. Do you know what I'm saying? No one, Steve. You don't want to scare the kids away, mate. <laughs> <laughs> yes, mate. Um, while we're, we're here, tell us a bit about your your bushcraft training or, or what. All oh, right, yeah, yeah. So, um, separate from the from this here, really, I'm doing. I've also got a company called First In Events, and the idea is well, First In was the motto of the Pathfinders. So the idea is to base things on military themed stuff, particularly about what we do in Pathfinders. And as I said, I did the SEER course three times over just for a treat. And I run, actually, I'm actually running one this weekend, the Survival Weekend, down in Evesham, uh, near Worcester. Uh, and we also run the Fan Dance. We've got that in May. Uh, and Tandem Skydive Days as well. Again, you know, like the Halo type. It's, it's that kind of thing, three, four. So we do military type events. And again, yeah, I've got a website, um, firstinvents.com. And basically, it's, you know, helping people get out off their sofas and go and do more interesting stuff rather than sitting there and watching telly all the time. Yes, got you. And um, Bushcross become really popular, isn't it, in the last 10 years? Yeah, it has. It used to be one of those things that was seen to be a bit of a weirdo thing, a bit geeky. But actually, it's it's good life skills, actually, you know, um, getting out there in the wilderness, apart from the fact that it, it, it's good for your mental health, isn't it, getting out of the woods and doing stuff rather than, again, just being locked in and watching telly all the time. But it's, it's good life skills, you know, learning, learning how to build a shelter, learn how to build a fire, how to purify water, all that good stuff. Yes, I'm just going to flash up your your bushcraft knife here. I take it that's yours, is it? It's got a... Your... Is that the one with a logo on it? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I wasn't really intending on going down the route of selling things, but um, after being on... Uh, YouTube for a little while people are asking for merchandise things like hats and stuff and um, someone I know runs a company called Hangar 39 in Colchester and he just suggested to me mate I've, I can you know make you up logo knives for your company if you want to and they've become really popular actually so you know fair play and it, it is a good knife that MOD survival knife not just saying it I've beasted the crap out of it and it still looks virtually brand new the one I've got it's it's a hell of a sturdy knife so yeah Cracking bit of kit. Yeah, you can see that. I don't know if you're aware, but I've just I just made my first uh bushcraft knife. Have you really? Yeah. Oh, awesome. Yeah, well it's sort of a stroke between bushcraft and um sheath knife type type yeah. type uh affair. Yeah, I went to a, a bush do you know the bushcraft weekend? It's it's held on a yeah. bi bison farm somewhere. Yeah, I've been to it before. I haven't been to it for a little while. I think it was, well, it's been shut off because of COVID, hasn't it, the last couple of years. I have been to it, though, yeah. Yeah, I went I went there, God, 15 years ago or something, and the buddy I was with, we, we stopped at one of the knife makers, and after, you know, watching his, his lecture and everything, we I bought some uh, antler horn All right. and some kind of... I don't know what you call it, but this phony fake material discs so you use a lot of. Yeah. I don't know what you call it, like this prefab sort of material you can use for knife making, and yeah. And I, my my idea was right. I go home and make a knife, and of course it's not that simple. Yeah. Um, but over the course of the next fifteen years, I managed to get all the equipment together to actually be able to make it and to temper it in a in an oven that I built and yeah and put etch my my logo on and and uh and it's amazing it's pretty smart um people say it's actually, that's a definition of a long term project right there isn't it? Oh yeah. well yeah it is but <laughs> I'm just one of those people I never say no to anything you know if I want to do something yeah. I'll, I'll store it on the back burner in my mind and and yeah. and funny enough I seem to have they all, it all seems to come to, yeah. to come good. So yeah, yeah. um getting back to your military career then Tom. Yeah. Um did you uh, in terms of action did you see much action I mean obviously you saw action in the pathfinders but did you see yeah. active service type action? So the um operational deployments I did with, with the pathfinders was Kosovo, Macedonia, uh, Iraq during the invasion and then a couple of a couple to Afghanistan. 
and in particular the Afghanistan ones, yeah, they, they were hectic. Both tours, very, very busy both mm. times. Um, I actually missed Sierra Leone. I was pretty gutted about that, to be honest. Um, I went to the Red Devils uh, in January 2000, I think it was. And the, literally a couple of months later, the guys got deployed to Sierra Leone PF. And Steve Brown was with those, and I was chinned. I was absolutely gutted. I actually tried going back, but the deployment was so rapid, I missed it. Mm. Um, but yeah, Afghan in particular, it was hectic, really hectic. Um, we was the first time, 2006, we was stuck in a place called Musicala for a couple of months. Um, and we was under siege there, getting shot at, mortared, you know, and all that good stuff every day, bringing in airstrikes to right up to the close by the edge of the compound. Um, and it was one of those things where it was like the best time of life, but the worst time at the same time, you know, because the, 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 there was the opportunity to get wasted or badly injured every day. Um, and the living conditions were absolutely horrendous. But at the same time, you were getting to do the stuff you always wanted to do, you know, getting to drop bombs off with an aircraft, watching the A-10s doing strafing runs just outside, you know, brassing the enemy up, all the good stuff that you always wanted to do when, if, you, if you're really into soldiering, that's the stuff you want to do. Mm. And did you, uh, can you tell us a, about the firefights you've been involved in? Uh, yeah. I think the first big one was uh, the the Taliban tried taking taking out the compound basically that we were staying in. They they kind of softened us up a little bit with bits and pieces. Uh, and the first big one was they 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 tried a full on assault onto the compound, and they'd overrun it before we got there, or partially overrun it before we got there. And we went there to reinforce it. And yeah, there was one particular one that was just it was bedlam. I mean, there was an RPG went through. Um, the, the top of a building where we were all st stood firing and it smashed a uh, bamboo cane and, but carried on going without exploding. If that had exploded, it probably would have took us all out, at least with shrapnel anyway. It, it just literally just missed the OC's head because the OC was kind of walking from one point to another to give fire control orders or whatever. Uh, and that was pretty hectic. Um, mm. And, you know, like that scene out of um, Full Metal Jacket where they're all firing onto a building and the whole building's just like covered in dust and strikes. That was basically, it was like a, a remake of that, but in reality. Um, blokes on 50 cows giving it big licks, mm. you know, GPMGs, because they, they were basically coming at us and we just hit them with a wall of fire. It was flipping amazing. It's one of those things that just like, shit, I wish I had a video camera to film, film this because it was freaking awesome. Uh, but obviously pretty scary, but awesome at the same time. Did you lose many colleagues? Uh, so during that deployment, we were quite lucky. Um, so 2006, we, we got away with it. Um, there was a couple of guys quite badly injured that were attached to us, that were engineers at the start of the tour. But we, we basically were very, very lucky not to lose anyone on that tour. Um, 2010, um, we was on the BRF role that time round, and my platoon actually got hosed down by an American F-18, obviously accidentally, and um, one of one of the guys in my platoon was shot straight through the chest, um, killed instantly, and a couple of guys injured. Um, his name was John Howard, uh, nicknamed Jack Howard, and he was a Kiwi, um, really good guy, and really sad loss. Um, and I was one of the people that kind of wrapped him, well, you know, took him to the vehicle just after that, and it was like something like the First World War. We were up to our knees in mud, carrying a, a, you know, one of our dead mates, and it's not the sort of thing you expect to be doing in this, you know, 21st century soldier and everyone thinks it's all about digital stuff don't they you know and mm. all that crap but it's not it's still about that first world war you know going through the mud fighting fighting the enemy at close quarters as, as we know now in uh, ukraine yes and when you're not uh teaching the bushcraft and and uh throwing yourself out of plane still what what do you do with your days well i'm um, pretty pretty busy so we've got those two things there i'm also heading up the local parachute regiment association so that's a veterans association uh, we represent the regiment at things like funerals and stuff we've got a big org uh, thing organized for august a big party as well uh, i've also got a full-time job so i'm working as a school staff instructor at a cadet force now at a school locally um, and i'm in a parachute team as you mentioned as well um, so doing parachute displays into events and stuff like that so pretty busy like i don't have many minutes to spare in a day i've got so well it sounds like from your history mate you you you're not a man that would want spare minutes in a day 
<laughs> yeah, I tend to fill it up with busy stuff. Mm. And obviously uh, the, the YouTube stuff, you know, and that, that, that was just like a sideline, really. Uh, that was just lockdown project because you couldn't get out of the house. Um, and then that's, that's got kind of grown arms and legs now. So that's, that's become pretty successful. Never Brilliant. saw myself doing things like YouTube, but, you know, weird things happen during pandemics, I guess. Yes, yes. Um, Tom, if you could do me a favour, if you could email me just all the links to, to all the things we've discussed that you want to promote. Yes, yeah, we'll do. Um, I can give them to Luke then and we can get them promoted below below the video. Roger. Um, anything big on the horizon you'd like to talk about? Or uh, Well, the main one really is we've got, you know, the events going on with first in events. So this weekend is the Bushcraft weekend, it's Bushcraft and Survival. And then that's the next one's the uh, May fan dance on the 15th of May. Um, so going over the SS selection route that you do as part of selection, getting basically taking people through that, you know, and um, making it a safe event. That's the next big thing on the horizon, really. Mm, incredible. Tom, I'm going to wish you all the best there and thank you massively for coming on the show. Cheers, mate. Um, second Pathfinder we've had on the, sh on the show now. Had to work. It's like buses, isn't it? You wait four years for them and then they all come along at the same time. <laughs> yeah, mega. But, uh, mate, I wish you all, all the best. Um, good luck. Good luck with the jumping. Good luck with the bushcraft. Good luck with all the cadets. And yeah. uh, let's, chat, let's chat again at some point. Cheers, Mucker. Appreciate it. Yeah, no worries. Just stay on the line, Tom. Uh, hey, to all our wonderful friends at home, um, I didn't see any... I'm just going to flash up the chat here just to say thank you to everyone who's um, who's who's bore with us. Sorry, it's been uh, buffering, folks. I think it's because I had stuff uploading to YouTube, which is silly me. But I can only remember so many things in this uh, aging head of mine. Um, so look. thinking about crayons, weren't you eating crayons at the time? <laughs> That's it. <laughs> That's it. Dance like easier life, just eating crayons. Um, <laughs> but hello to Paul, Jed, Never, Darren, Greg, Diamond, Dog, um, and Jane. Good old Jane's always support, uh, always, um, always supports the podcast. And uh, yes, and to everybody at home, much love to you all. Please look after yourselves, and we will see you next time. Thank you.